So I, uh, oh, so, so I wrote a poem to read. And the poem is called Dunamis. And dunamis in Greek means power. And the very thing that we walk in here not realizing how much of it we destroyed, but when we accept the power of Christ, we walk out of here with our heads up, never again to walk in the back door, never again to have to duck in an aisle at Walmart because we didn't want a certain somebody to see us. In fact, what we do is we become a light so bright that they're attracted to us. And so this, this poem, Dunamis, is about us and then what we turn into. Me. Me. What is wrong and so wrong with me? Am I that broke from the spirit that hides from me? I made you cry when I lied, and you said he died for me. When my wrongs became right, you put me first and you got behind me, and everything outside of my skin tries to get inside of me. But what the devil has done will never be fun because I'm not too blind to see. But the struggle to stay clean is living like a spiritual rivalry. The mannerisms of my past that seem to last has created my identity, yet it is blood that flows and swims inside of me. So why do I still do wrong? When the guide is right, like I'm just overriding me. So the only time I'm speaking truth is when I lie to me? Man? If I can't even love me, then I should say goodbye to me. But Jesus shouted, die in the flesh. It's time to see. And he, then he confided in me. He said, you're a son, part of the one, and you started shining me. He's removing layers of grime and years of crime and became a new life in me. So all that was dark is now so free, become instant light and the truth for sea. Jesus gave me a deal for real, so I re-upped to thee. Re-upped. But I had to do my part with the divine spiritualism. I had to step into the tub of life, the holy baptism. And I went as a boy like from hell prison, and I came out a man like the king had been risen. But the birth of the ministry, the 99 vision, placed us right in the spirit and out of the secularism. But looking back, I see all things that were wrong. That I claimed as me, I counted as God in the image of three. I thought I was the trinity. But I didn't even know myself, let alone live as three. I was too busy stealing joy and excusing it with a please, standing so weak for nothing when I had strong knees. So I get to my knees, the prayer blessings to see his holy face. I give him his time and he shows me my place. I walk in relationship truth, not a spiritual separation race. But how do you tell me that you know my past when you can't see inside of me? Ah, but you, you, I can't be wrong when you created me. I'm not broke. The spirit is right here inside of me. Dunamis. <laughs> Dunamis is going to lead into our lesson where the spirit is inside of us. Step three now is talking about we made a decision to turn our will and our life over the care of God. The minute that we made that decision, we turned on a power. The minute we decided to accompany something in our life, no longer having to free will it, no longer having to solo walk it, no longer having to lay in a room at night at 3 o'clock in the morning when everyone that you love is in bed, and you really wish you were there with them. Really wish you were there with them. But there's that thing inside of your head that just doesn't let you do it. And you do it in enough times so where finally you have to turn that off so you don't ever feel that bad again. But it catches up with us. And all of a sudden, that little voice starts talking to us again, that power. That power that's telling us that we want a different life. But most of us want something, we just don't know how to get it. We don't exactly know how to turn that will and that life over to the care of God. We don't really know what to do or how do I relate to others. How does a meth addict relate to a hurting single mom that just wants her husband back? But there's a relationship. There is something so uniquely bonding with all of us in here, that that's why we are so different in personalities, but we're not so different in spirit. We're definitely not so different in hurt, habit, or hang-up, and we're certainly not so different in the outcomes of where we can go with this if we just rely on something other than ourselves. Sometimes we have to rely on each other. That's not always a bad thing, but you got to learn from the very minute if you are in a relationship with a toxic person, 
You cannot sit there and be comfortable in toxics. You will not flourish. In fact, what you think that you're doing to save that person, it will come back. Jen gave her testimony last night at The Rock, and she told everyone. She said, I had met this dude that I was going to save. I knew he was a drug addict. Jen knew I did dope. Jan was my best driver. She would drive me to the dope man's house because she wanted to save me from getting arrested. She did everything she could to protect me, and I violated it over and over again because I didn't have dunamis. I had no power. Jan wanted to save me. She wanted to make me safe. She wanted me to see the very God that she could see. But the problem was is my mouth was as loud as God's mouth at that time in her life, and I was speaking so much to her. I was telling her all these things and trying to get her to do this and that. And what I wound up doing is instead of her taking me to God, I pulled her right out of it. That is the problem. I was toxic. By all rights, she should have gotten rid of me. I was no good to her. I wasn't a family man. I didn't know how to raise kids. I didn't, I, I didn't know how to make money because I would either, well, I'd just spend it. I had nothing, no good quality at all to give to her. She should have gotten rid of me, but she didn't. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm absolutely blessed for that and glad. And um, there is nobody, my kids too, my biological kids, there is nobody that I will put in front of my wife ever again. Not a dope dealer, not a hungry addict, not my children that needs what, no one goes before her except for God. So that's a given. Because I had to understand when I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, it wasn't so that I could just stay out of jail, right? It's not just so that I could get a good job. It's not just so that I can start getting along with other family members. When I turn my life and my will and over to the care of God, it's for the things that I don't even know that God's going to place me in. But if I'm going to have my will and my life turned over to the care of God, I've got to understand that I'm saying yes to some things about my life that I don't even know. And I'm telling God, okay, bro, I'm going with you on this. Yes. And he's saying, just wait. Because the problem is, is we forget six months down the road when God, you know, calls us. Hey, I need you to go talk to that person. I can't, I'm running late. Okay. And he lets it go. Now, in my case, he didn't let me go. He gave me flat tires when I really was in a hurry. And, and I, I think he laughed about that. I'm okay with that. When God calls us, when we, when we accept that calling in step three, we have to make sure that we follow that. In the book of Acts, Ananias and his wife made a deal. They were allowed to set the terms up for the deal. They were allowed to tell them how much money they're going to, they, said they had everything they could set the parameters up however they wanted, but they made a commitment to a certain standard with God. And then what happens is, is they made some money off this deal. But when they had all this money in their hand when they were holding it, you know, when we're holding that very thing in their hand, and we're, it's not so fun to give away then. Do you know how many things I say yes to in the week? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll help you. I'll help you. It's all great seven days away, but the day I have to do it, I'm like, I wish I was sick. I don't want to go. I don't really want to help. But if you make that commitment, if we make it to God and to each other, Ananias didn't keep his commitment and he died on the spot. Do not think that the Lord will not use some things against you or on you if you didn't fulfill a promise that you made with him, especially if we initiate it. If I initiate a promise to God through the step work and then I decide to do something different, I may deserve what I get. Now, we all think that death is harsh, and, and that could have been easily explained, right? Okay, so Ananias had a heart attack. Something happened bad in recovery. We can explain it. Well, then when his wife walked in and they asked her about it and she claimed the same lie as he did, she fell over. Now, I'd like to see whoever was sitting in that room dare tell a lie, you know what I'm saying? I bet they're all speaking truth. I did this, I did this, I did that. I would be. I did it all. But there is a reason. The lesson tonight was about action. What is action? Action is doing something, right? We're doing something. We're getting involved. But it has to be powered by something. It has to be powered by faith. The actions that I'm taking when I am working so hard, I don't know about you guys, but there's some time where I'm working on my recovery and I'm going to meetings and I'm giving to people and I'm talking to people on the phone and I'm getting a relationship here and there and then I don't understand why my home life is falling apart. It don't make a bit of sense. It don't make a bit of sense that I can get along with everybody in the world but me and my wife can't talk. It don't make a bit of sense that I can talk to every kid, hug every kid, love every kid, but then I can't stand my own. None of that makes a bit of sense, but it happens. 
It happens. And so we got to wonder what's going on. There has to be an action. There has to be something that's power in that action, and that's faith. And this is how that works. If I'm doing something and I'm so defeated because I can't get along with the people I love, I'm so defeated because I keep not getting the same job or, or I want a certain job and I didn't get that job and I didn't get that job and it doesn't make sense why I don't get that job because I really want a job and I don't want anything for free. I just want to work and I feel defeated. And faith is telling you it's going to be there. Keep walking. Because my action wants to stop. There's a lot of times where I just want to stop. There's a lot of times where I don't want to get out of bed then. I don't want to go to work. Oh, if they don't want me there, I don't want to go anywhere. Uh, the van doesn't run. Ministry's over. I don't want to do it no more. There's a lot of time that my action wants to stop, but when I have the faith behind me and the faith is driving me, it's like spiritual gasoline. Take another step, bro. Take another one. Just take another one. And when I sit there and listen to that faith, and when it tells me to take it step by step, that's a whole lot easier than thinking i got to get from here to Brownstown today. I start thinking about all that, and I'm going to sit right where I'm at, right? I'm going to sit there like this whether there's a car there or not. But if I'm just taking one step, and each step is closer, you know, you, after a certain period of time, if, if, you just, if you look behind you one time, you're going to see that you've made some distance. If you accept the distance for what it is, if you accept for where you're at right now, and this is where God is placing you, and these are the things in your life that you're doing. And they're not everything that you ever wanted. I get that. But they're everything that you need right now in this time period. If you can accept that, your life will be happy. You will have a joy. When you are working through your problems using Jesus, you will find joy at the end of that. If you are working through your problems through yourself, you're going to be one upset person and really not fun to hang around with. There are times at work where I will get myself so twisted up because I'm, I, I sit here and literally go, I'm not telling you about this, God. I'm going to stay mad. I want to stay mad for the next 20 minutes. I want to stay mad at my boss. I want to stay mad at this person. I don't want to have to do something about it, so I'm not going to say nothing. Well, the bad part about it is when I get home and everyone's all smiling laughing, I'm like, why are you guys happy? Because I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in an awful mood, I don't want happy and peppy. I don't want, hey, how you doing? I'm good. I remember when I had my first sponsor, he told me, he said, you need to call these men when you're, when you're in a bad mood. This is what's going to help you get out of it. Well, apparently he thought that I understood what he meant. Because when I was in a bad mood, I was like, all right, let's see how this really works. I was going to prove him wrong. And I called him. This guy's all, man, brother, I'm so glad you called. And, and, and we're going to figure out what's going on. And I'm like, yuck. And I hung up on him. I thought, it didn't work. So I called the next person. Hey, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm, not, I'm upset, and I might use, and I, and I need to talk to someone. Brother, we can help you out, and, I, and I'm so glad you called. And I'm like, what? And I hung up on him. And it wasn't making sense what was going on. And finally, the fourth or fifth person I called, and I said, I said, man, I'm, I'm supposed to call you because I'm hurt. And he's like, what, you think you're the only one that got problems? I got my own problems, you know, how am I going to sit here and help you? I'm like, oh, you can talk, good. See, I thought that I was supposed to find someone worse than me that was going to help me. Because I want to surround myself with the people that are like-minded. But if I'm in a toxic mind, I'm not going to do any good for anybody. And when I'm in a toxic mind, I want to find toxic people, and I want to stay sick. Step three is teaching us to walk out of that sickness. Walk out of that toxic place in your life where no longer where you want it to be acceptable, the things you do. We don't want to have an acceptance of that. There are so many things in our life and our situations we wish were, and we can wish, and it's okay to wish and hope, and we want things to be different, but until you put something into action, it's going to stay the same. But you don't even know if those actions are going to work. That's the scary part, right? Well, I, if I knew it would work, I would do it. Well, that's not faith, if you need proof. So you want the action, you really want, but you just don't know, and that's where faith will drive that. Now, here's the other side of it, too. Faith by itself won't help you either. And the example of that, though, and this is Jan's example, if you are standing in front of a train and it's coming at you and you know you should move, right? And you say, I have faith. God's going to get me out of this. He's going to save me. And I'm sitting there going, bro, you better get off the track. Nope. I got faith. God loves me. I love God. And I'm, I'm going to be all right. You know what I'm going to do? I'm walking away because it ain't going to work that way. Faith by itself has got to be accompanied by its partner. If you, look at, if you look at action as the body, then make sure you understand that faith is a breath. And it's a beautiful combination when we learn to put those two things together. 
sometimes some of us coming in here, we have a little of one and not enough of the other. And so you just kind of got to start strengthening and start trying to balance that out. If you are weak in your faith areas, start placing those areas to God. Throw them right out to him. I'm struggling with a, a boss at work, God, and I just need someone to pray for me. I don't know if it's going to work. may may not. It doesn't sound good on paper. But look what happens to a person when it does. It will just, it will put so much joy in them that you will be getting these weird text messages at 11 o'clock at night saying, you won't believe how happy I am. They will bring a joy and peace. And when you get a bowl of God joy, when you get a bowl of God joy in your life in that moment, you can't just sit on that. You know what I'm saying? You are calling people. You don't care what hour it is. You're calling and sharing. You got to hear this. You got to hear that. You got to hear this. And you share it. Because God never intended for joy to be used as a selfish thing. It was never intended for that. Joy is something that as Christians, as people in recovery, this is the very thing that we can share for the next person that may help them in their walk. So why does Celebrate Recovery work? Why, why does all the, the people that we, that we have here can come together and fit? And, and I've always kind of wondered that, right? I've always wondered, how, how do all these personalities come into this room? I mean, it just can't be because we're broken, messed up, and we mostly have all felonies. It's got to be something a little bit more than that. And I remember walking into a meeting, and we didn't identify ourselves by a drug, but we identified ourselves by whose probation officer, who had what. And we're like, oh, we're brothers, so, you know, Aaron Loudon's people sit here. And, you know, Barb Stouts is over here. And we're like, oh, you're just Mr. Mary. So we classify each other in weird areas. We will bind together with people of like minds. But do we ever look for like hearts? Are we always so quick to jump on what, what we each look like, what we're each speaking about? Because I tell you, there's some people in here that are really, really tough talking, acting, and sounding. They're the nicest, lovable person. They've just had to use that all their life. I've seen some people in here that have such a loving, tender, soft heart. And it's lost within a week. And they're just desperate. Desperate to try to find something different and they're stuck. Kelsey, my daughter here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You called me at 4.30 in the morning. This is when we're going to talk about this. So, when does dad get to be a hero? Well, after you use meth with your daughter and sell meth with your daughter and do all that fun stuff and, and keep secrets from mom, <laughs> we had a really interesting life. And she, we, we would leave Indianapolis and she would tell me, she'd say, uh, make sure you kiss mom and tell her I love her. And we both knew that I couldn't do that. So I had to find like, indirect ways to, to kiss her and tell her that, that Kels loves her. Um, but it dawned on me one day that when I was leaving Kelsey that, wait a minute, she's sending her stepdad, stepfriend, back home to her mom. I'm stepdad, but I'm a meth head, and she knows how meth, most meth guys are. I didn't realize what a bad position I put her into. And really the only thing that Kelsey could do during that time was just smile. And I never really knew if she felt bad about it or mad about it, but she smiled. And we, and we just did what us meth heads do. She never, we never fought really too much about all that stuff. We both had an understanding that we loved her mom. I should have been a better example. God gave me a, a wonderful young girl to, to take care of and to watch out, not meth up. And the selfishness got in there. And so getting clean, you know, when we're getting clean and we're trying to figure out, do relationships come back? Are, are we ever going to get respect and trust back? Are we ever going to get that? When Kelsey called at 4.30 in the morning, she said, I got to come home. I want to come home. I need you to come get me. Not you, Mom. I need Jason to come get me. I'm walking out that door. I got my clothes on. Now, I, I'm going to Indianapolis at, at 4 o'clock in the morning, so I, took, I had to get my rings on. I had to get all my stuff on. Right? But I did. Yeah. Um, but when it comes, but here's the, here's the thing I want you guys to understand. It's not just because it was Kelsey. I've got to do what God calls me to do. If God is calling us to do that, then listen. I was just blessed enough for it to be Kelsey this time. And so we get to this house that's been known to, to deliver drugs, get drugs. And, uh, oh, anyway, hold on. I have Roger with me. Big Roger. Uh, and uh, he's on my couch. He was going to take a weekend away from Todd's place, so he had vacation at my house. 
So he's sleeping on the couch, and, I'm, and I get my all my stuff on. And at 4.30, I'm, I'm standing over like, Roger, Roger, bro, bro. And he's like, what? And I said, we're going to Indianapolis. We are extracting a little girl from a drug house, and she's coming home. And he's like, for real? And I go, yeah. And he's like, let's rock and roll. Dude, he, he's walking around the living room. He's like, oh, yeah, we're doing this, man. We're doing this. And I'm like, oh, my God, what happened here? Like, yeah, he was intense. And I was like, I'm bringing the right guy. I am bringing the right guy. So he, he's, he's throwing stuff on, and... <laughs> Oh, my goodness, you're talking about the ride up there. The, the problem that I found with this is we were too excited about doing this. There was something about, and I've got to watch this and do step work, there was something about that lifestyle that still attracts me to it. And the problem with that is if I go to that lifestyle to meet some type of need, how many times does it take before I'm not doing something so good? Because remember, it tells us in the step work, be careful, brother, if you're going to go and take care and watch someone, because you're tempted yourself. So me and Roger pull up to the house, and uh, I text Kelsey, and I said, I'm here. And if anybody knows Kelsey, if you want her to come over on Friday, you've got to tell her the Monday before. <laughs> so she can start getting ready. Yeah. And so I already knew that I, it were, I was going to be there for a minute. I, I didn't have no reservation about that. And, and so I get out of the car, because I'm not sitting in the car. And I get out, and I'm just staring at the house, 5, 5.30 in the morning. And Roger walks up behind me, and he says, all right, I got my back on your back. I'm watching the backside. You watch front side, and we'll collaborate. And I'm like, well, I brought the right person. I really did. <laughs> so, so we're giving each other, like, every 30-second updates. Clear? All right, clear. And uh, so all of a sudden, a guy come walking down with a flashlight. I got, I got a guy with a flashlight. And then a car's coming this way, and then a car's coming down this way, and the car pulls right in front of my car and stops. And I'm like, this dude stopped. He turns around and tells me, this guy just pulled him backwards in the slot. And Roger looks at me and he goes, get ready. We're about to do what we came down here to do. And I'm like, oh, he is serious. It's like, I said, I'm going to be here. I may just sit down and watch, but this, he's ready. And so, and of course, we're addicts, so we have to intensify our drama in our head. And that person went in their house, and, and this other person went in the house, and, and then they came out and, Asked what we're doing there, and, and I told her, I said, I'm waiting for Kelsey, and I'm not leaving this spot until she comes out. And, and here she came. Now, the, now the, here's the thing. How many of you guys in, in your lives said, I'm going to quit on Friday? And Monday was solid. Every day was solid until Thursday night. And Friday, you found why you needed to just go ahead and do it Monday. You know? And I thought about that, and, and Jan, when Jan talked, and she said, don't be mad if Kelsey doesn't come. I can't be mad because what I know is now Kelsey knows that she needs a change. And it'll eat her up if she stays. And she got in the car and was bringing this girl home. Now, it's funny because when she saw Roger, she thought, you brought Roger? All you got to do is talk to him five minutes. You find out he's a whole different dude. He's a whole different dude. But she stayed. And she says, I want something different. I remember that step. I remember the powerlessness the wonder, not having a lot of faith, but knowing what it's supposed to be, understanding that there are people around me that are being very successful, but the way I've lived my life in the past, does that mean because they had success, I don't, I can? Because I know in my life, I've sat there and compared myself to a lot of people. My problem is, is I always compare myself to the people that are way, way above me, way, way above me. Every once in a while, I need to turn my head back and compare someone that's in a different level than me going down. And I can have a lot more gratitude that way. But what I have to understand is, is God is developing individual relationships with us. All he's calling us to do is to go find that one. Go tell that one that it's going to be okay. And when they ask you, how do you know it's going to be okay? Is it really going to be okay? Don't lie to them and just say, well, it will be. Say, no, it's going to, it's going to be hard at first. But I want every hard thing to happen in my life while I have every one of you around me so that I understand what to do, how to get through it, so that I don't ever have to go back through that pain again and call that life. I am not fear of dying. I'm afraid of living, using again. Because that's death. To be okay going to hotel rooms, to be okay lying to my family, to be, to be okay giving up my smile, that's death. I don't want that, man. So when I get into early recovery, when I get in groups like this, I want to talk to people. I know that I necessarily can't ask you how I'm going to do it, how you did it. It's got to be based on an attraction. 
not the promotion of it. I just need you guys to tell me, all right, just sit still long enough and let God do his thing. But the problem is, is because of Nintendo, where there was a quick, easy A, B button, I'm instant gratification, I want it now. But I've always found out that anything that I get right now doesn't usually last. It's by my own self-motivated need. But the things that I work for, the things that I invest in, I keep. I keep. So, Romans, I could sleep. God has been really jacking with me a lot. Um, I have been going to bed at, oh, that's another thing, at 4.30 in the morning. I have a little game on Facebook that I'm absolutely addicted to called Fishdom. And I had gotten, I won six hours free to play, and I was going to play every last one of them. And I was up till 2 o'clock that morning playing Fishdom. And, uh, and so then I had to get up at 4.30. God said, all right, go ahead, stay up there, funny guy. Um, but he's been really keeping me up a lot, and, and Jan reminded me that if I'm awake, I don't need to be playing my little game. If God is keeping me awake, maybe I need to be getting in the Word. And, and I'm, I'm awful, guys. I'm like, Bible, Facebook. I can get a little Facebook on the Bible, or a little Bible on the Facebook. No, because when I read Romans, I decided to get up and do that. And, and I had, I, it was kind of cool, man. I had my babe, my coffee, it was dark. Kids weren't even talking. Well, they were, but, um, but this is what I read. And, sure. All right. Last night, I, I was moving around. I figured if I got into a different bed or a different place to sleep, that maybe I could go to sleep faster. I fell asleep on the recliner, and apparently the buoyancy or something changed, and I, I had a dream that I was falling, and the recliner flipped back this way, and Robbie was on the couch, and I was laying there going, I can't get up, I can't get up. So, but that wasn't that night. But I read, I read Romans, and, and this is why I Celebrate Recovery works. This is why churches work. This is why we all know each other before we ever have to talk to each other. So cool. First, Paul explains, God does not make a distinction between us as individuals. We are all guilty and we are all offended. I mean, I'm sorry. We are all guilty and we are all offered his free gift of salvation. As individuals, it doesn't matter individually what we've done. We're all guilty and we're all offered the same thing. That totally wipes out any individual thing. Well, they're, they're taller. They, they got more money. They don't. We're all guilty, and we're all offer salvation. That's one point. That's cool. That, that, right away, that just sucked the whole room into one. Second point. He goes on. He's good. Second, he says, we can all be freed from sin's power through God's grace and the Holy Spirit within us. If we all take that to heart, we can all be free from sin. All of us can be free from sin, but the only way we're going to be free from our sin is through his power. So once again, we all have access to the same power, the same direction, and we all have access to the same outcome. It just brought our group in that much closer. The third thing he says, we all in recovery, in some type, fashion, or form, we're all in recovery. Robbie's going to have to go to Spenders Anonymous. You know, there are other people that have other little funny little things. I'm going to have to go to Fishdom Anonymous. We all are in a recovery, and therefore, we have no grounds to be arrogant towards someone else. I can't sit here and make fun of Robbie every time he buys something and bring it home when I just played eight hours of a game on Facebook. <laughs> My kids are like, Dad, I'm hungry. I said, there's a... Oh, yeah. So I could, they had a special deal on bombs. You, for four ninety nine. you could have all sorts of bombs. And, and, and I, was, I was like, Jan, give me the card. Because I can't keep it. I'm not allowed. I spend money. And I said, Jan, give me the card. And she's like, it's been stolen. And so uh, I'm not going to get the deal. Courtney, Courtney, I need your card. And, and so I, I, hey, I'll go to any lengths, right, to get my fix. Don't we do that? And I got my bombs and stuff. I cannot do something like that and look at Robbie with arrogance for what he does. Or look at someone else with arrogance because of what they do to fill whatever void they're trying to fill. If I understand that the process is the same, the only thing that changes is substance, the chemical, or, or whatever the case is, but the filling of the hole, if we're doing it without God, 
It's still the same process. So we all become closer because none of us have to be arrogant about the other person. And I, 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 we've all done that. Oh, you know, right. We all got to remember to respect each other because we're all messes. We're all messes. The fourth thing, because of God's mercy, we all must respect one another. Because God had mercy on us, because God had mercy on the things in our life. There's straight battle royal in there. Because God had a mercy for us, we have to respect one another. We can't be given free mercy, free love, free everything, and then turn around and just break someone down. That doesn't make sense. Because if we are misusing God's gift, it can be taken from us. And anything that God gives us freely, he can remove. And the funny thing is, or the cool thing about that is, if you get back into the will of God, he can put it back in your life pretty darn quick again. So, step three. As, you, as you're working on this step, where you're making your decision to turn your will in your life over the care of God as you understand him, make sure that this is a step that you actually want to honestly take. And I want you what you to do when it says, as you understand him, I want you to define the terms of what you want to release to him. Because sometimes as addicts, we've got to hold on to some things. And I'm not a, a miser. I'm okay with that. You want to hold on to some character defects? By all means, go ahead. You'll get rid of them later on. If that's what makes you feel safe about some things. But what I want you to do, if you're going to make a decision, turn some things in your life over to God and let him work on them things. Let him show you. Let him show you what he's about. Give him the things in your life that maybe you're struggling with a little. And as that gets better, you give him something else. And as that gets better, you give him something else to where you're so excited you can't wait to find out what kind of problem you have so you can give it to him. So that it can be replaced with something. Me and Jan had this money box, right? Now, we never had a money box before because, well, because I was spending money like two weeks ahead on meth. So we never had a money box. And we had a little money box. And we had a couple hundred dollars in there for, at one time. And we were so excited, right? I mean, that's good for when you have to choose between toilet paper and toothpaste, too. I got a couple hundred dollars in there. And uh, we had some things come up, and Jan's like, you're getting into the box. Don't touch the box. This box had become like the golden elephant in our house. We would walk by the box and be like, uh, we got a box. Yeah. And so, and then what God showed me is if we are not willing to give up our possession or we're not willing to empty out the thing inside of us, how can he ever fill it with what he needs to fill it with? If I want to keep it so full with what I want, God isn't going to argue with me and be like, no, 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 you want this. He's going to say, okay, when I choose and decide, to give up the things of that box, the things of my wants. Man, there's some cool things coming for us. I love you guys. Talk to each other. Let's take a break, and then we'll come back and group up.